Good morning. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 16 through 34. One day, when we were on the way to the place for prayer, we met a slave woman. She had a spirit that enabled her to predict the future. She made a lot of money for her owners through fortune-telling. She began following Paul and us, shouting, These people are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation to you. She did this for many days. This annoyed Paul so much that he finally turned and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave her. It left her at that very moment. Her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone. They grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the officials in the city center. When her owners approached the legal authorities, they said, These people are causing an uproar in our city. They are Jews who promote customs that we Romans can't accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attacks against Paul and Silas, so the authorities ordered that they be stripped of their clothes and beaten with a rod. When Paul and Silas had been severely beaten, the authorities threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to secure them with great care. When he received these instructions, he threw them into the innermost cell and secured their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. All at once, there was such a violent earthquake that it shook the prison's foundations. The doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer awoke and saw the open doors of the prisons, he thought the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted loudly, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for some lights, rushed in and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. He led them outside and asked, honorable masters, what must I do to be rescued? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. They spoke the Lord's word to them to him and everyone else in his house. Right then in the middle of the night, the jailer welcomed them and washed their wounds. He and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his home and gave them a meal. He was overjoyed because he and everyone in his household had come to believe in God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So early on in my seminary training, I can't remember exactly which class or which book it was that we were reading, but we were learning more about the role of a minister. And in this class, we were talking and learning about the three P's of being a minister, that there's the role of the pastor, the priest, and the prophet. And all those three things are part of being a spiritual leader, of being a minister or a pastor. So the pastor role is that role that I tend to like. I like them all, but I especially like the pastor role. The pastor is the one who shepherds the flock. The one who goes to the hospital, who visits with people, provides care, love, nurturing. This is what everyone wants from their pastor, right? Someone who will be there and hold your hand and shed tears with you if that's what you need. That's the pastor role. And I think that's kind of what I envisioned when I got into the ministry was that, oh, I get to love people. That'll be good. Well, then there's the role of the pastor that involves being a priest. And throughout scripture, the priest is the one who helps people encounter God. 
In the Old Testament, the priests were the ones who took people's offerings and offered them to God. The priests were the ones who led the people in church and in their religious activities. And so for me, the role of the priest is kind of what I'm doing now. It's leading worship and helping people to encounter God through worship. Well, then there's the role of the pastor, of the minister, that involves being a prophet. And throughout scripture, the prophets are the ones who spoke God's truth. Oftentimes, prophets are and were those who spoke difficult truths. Truth that comes from God, but oftentimes, prophets in the scripture were were, prophets. persecuted because of the truth that they were called to speak. Now, this is honestly the one that I struggle the most with of the three roles of the minister, of pastor, priest, and prophet. I want the least to fulfill that role of being a prophet because it's not popular. It doesn't earn you the Pastor of the Year Award when you have to speak God's difficult truth into the world. But today is one of those days when I cannot faithfully ignore that role. In our world, it is becoming increasingly difficult to ignore what's happening around us and not speak God's truth to it. So with that said, will you pray with me? Almighty God, we give you thanks even for this day. Lord, we thank you for the gift of gathering together. We thank you for the gift of a spiritual home. We thank you for speaking truth into our lives, especially for your scripture and how it still speaks today. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us, open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have for us today. May the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 20th century theologian Karl Barth was instrumental in writing the Barman Declaration, which was a declaration that rejected the influence that the Nazis were having on German Christianity at the beginning and throughout World War II. And in the Barman Declaration, he specifically argued that the church's alliance with God should always provide them with reason to resist the influence of other lords in their lives. They especially named Adolf Hitler as being one of those lords in the life of German Christianity. You know, scripture is pretty clear. It's one of the Ten Commandments that we should worship no other God than our God. But any time that we put anything above God, we are breaking that commandment. And according to the Barman Declaration, the people, the German Christians were putting Adolf Hitler above God. Karl Barth was known to have said to his students and to other pastors and theologians that we must hold a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in another hand. He argued that people of faith cannot ignore what is happening in the world around them. And I would argue that that is true. As people of faith, we cannot ignore what is happening in the world, in our country, and in our communities. The late Representative John Lewis coined the phrase, good trouble. 
He said it on March 1st, 2020, as he was standing on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, commemorating the 55th anniversary of the events of Bloody Sunday. Lewis said, get into good trouble, necessary trouble, and redeem the soul of America. Representative Lewis said those things as he remembered that day when he was beaten along with other peaceful protesters for walking across the bridge. That was not the first time that he used that phrase, good trouble, and he certainly lived that phrase. As a giant in the civil rights movement, Lewis believed and lived out the belief that good trouble is necessary. It is especially necessary when oppression exists in individuals, communities, and systems. And people of faith, people who proclaim to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, cannot ignore oppression. It's actually in our baptismal vows, in our hymnal. I forget what page it is in there. I think it might be page 35, where we ask people who are baptized, and we ask parents, we ask our church community, as you become a member of the church, if you will exist, resist evil and oppression in all the forms that they present themselves. And I have yet to hear someone say, nope, I'm not going to do that. So when we join a church, when we're baptized, when we say we're going to be a part of a faith community, we vow to resist evil and oppression in all of its forms. As people of faith, we cannot ignore what happens in the world, in our country, and in our communities. This past Thursday was actually a church holiday. It's one that we don't celebrate. It's not like Easter or Christmas. It's not even as exciting as Pentecost, which we'll celebrate next Sunday. But Thursday was Ascension Day. 40 days after Easter is the day when we remember Jesus rising into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus uh, tells us that Jesus appeared for a period of 40 days and 40 nights. And he was there with the disciples in verse 8 when he tells them, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after Jesus had said this, right before the disciples' eyes, he rose up into the sky and they watched him as he rose up. The way that I picture this in my mind, because it's the way my brain works, is I think of a helium balloon. When I was in elementary school, it was still considered okay to have balloon day. Now we don't do that as much because of environmental concerns. We know now that that's not the best thing to release plastic into the environment like that. But I remember Balloon Day, watching those balloons rise into the air until you couldn't see them anymore. And I can picture the disciples watching Jesus rising into the air until he disappeared into the clouds. And they were standing there, staring toward heaven, when two men in white robes stood next to them and said, Why are you standing here looking toward heaven? Jesus will come back the same way that you saw him go. The way that I've always read that scripture verse is these two men in white, these messengers from God, 
are saying to the disciples, come on now, guys, why are you staring into the sky? He's gone to heaven. He told you, go, do, make disciples, be in this world. Stop gazing into the sky and start looking around you. As people of faith, as followers of Jesus Christ, we cannot simply gaze into heaven, ignoring what's happening in the world, in our country, and in our communities. The text that we heard this morning from Acts chapter 16 is a continuation of what happened earlier in the same chapter. Paul and Silas and the rest of their crew are in Macedonia, specifically in the city of Philippi. They're teaching, they're praying, and they're engaging in the life of the community. And we know that Philippi was known to be a prosperous city. It was a colony of Rome. It was governed by Roman military officers. And there was kind of a sense of prosperity and peace, but it was a false peace. It's what's called Pax Romana, Romana, which is the peace of Rome. It was a peace that was brought on by oppression, by military occupation, occupation, yes, and a false sense of peace. In this context of false peace and oppression, Paul and Silas could not ignore what was happening. Part of what was happening around Paul and Silas in our scripture reading today is that there was this slave girl who was following them around. She followed them, kind of like your annoying kid brother or kid sister that you just want to go away. She followed them around, announcing, These men are the slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. Now on the surface, you might say, well, why was Paul so annoyed with this? The slave girl was saying things that were true. She didn't seem to be doing anything wrong. But imagine that they were out trying to meet people, to form relationships. And here she is saying, these men, they're the slave of the Most High God. Makes me think about when I'm trying to form relationships with people and just get to know them a little bit. And someone says, oh yeah, she's the preacher. Well, there goes any hope of having a regular conversation with someone. I imagine that Paul and Silas felt similar. Well, finally, after this slave girl had been following them around and shouting, Paul had had enough. Parents, you know that moment when you just snap? Paul turned around and healed that slave girl. He cast that spirit of divination right out of her. And we don't really know what happened to her after this point. But we do know that her owners were mad. You see, they profited off of this spirit that possessed her. Without this spirit, they lost a source of income. So they had Paul and Silas arrested, saying, These men are Jews, and they are causing an uproar in our city. They were causing good trouble, is what they were doing. The crowds joined into the attacks, Paul and Silas were stripped of their clothing. They were severely beaten with a rod. They were thrown into jail where they were shackled and left for the night. 
They were causing an uproar in the city by taking actions that would prevent the slave owners from continuing to profit off of the exploitation of this slave girl. While they were in prison, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the scripture says that all the other prisoners were listening to them. Paul and Silas in prison weren't moaning and complaining. Even though you know they had to have been in pain, they were beaten with rods. They were praying and singing hymns to God. In the book, The Children, by David Haberstam, there's a story of a young civil rights protester who was arrested in 1961 and was thrown into jail in Jackson, Mississippi. While he was in jail, this protester began to sing. Slowly, the other prisoners heard the singing and everyone got quiet until all you could hear was this young man singing hymns. The guard demanded that he be quiet. And he said, you can't quiet me, I'm going to keep on singing. And he was singing, the Lord is my shepherd. Paul and Silas were singing in jails and praying to God when suddenly there was a great earthquake, such a large earthquake that the the shackles broke away from them and the prison doors opened. And those prisoners could have easily escaped and walked right out of that jail, but they stayed. When the jailer realized that the doors were open. He assumed that the prisoners were gone, and he knew that if his rulers, if the other Romans saw that the prisoners had escaped, that he would be punished and blamed for their escape. He was so upset that he was about to kill himself before Paul spoke up and said, Wait! Do not harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer turned on the lights and rushed in, and he was so struck by what had happened that he went to Paul and Silas and said, What must I do to be rescued? Paul and Silas could not ignore what was happening around them. Not only did they liberate that oppressed slave girl, they liberated their fellow prisoners by leading them in singing hymns and praise to God, but they also liberated the instrument of oppression. They liberated that jailer and freed him from being an instrument of further oppression. The charge against Paul and Silas was that they were causing an uproar in the city. Causing an uproar. What were they doing? They were freeing those who were oppressed. Speaking life through the word of Jesus Christ bringing light into the darkness. This week, I've been pondering our world, pondering our country and our communities, realizing that we, as people of faith, cannot ignore what's happening around us. Our temptation is to offer our thoughts and our prayers, which, yes, of course, we need to pray and offer that to God and to those who are suffering. 
But I also think that God, through Scripture, is reminding us that we are called to do more. That we are called sometimes to get into good trouble. To cause an uproar. To speak truth and light. At the start of his ministry, Jesus proclaimed in the temple, in his home synagogue, that he had come to release the captives, to free those who were oppressed, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to proclaim that the year of the Lord had come. When he met with the disciples after his resurrection, he told them, go into the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Before he ascended into heaven, he told the disciples, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. It's going to come down on you, and when it does, you are to go. Go into your city, go into your state, go into your country, go throughout the world and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. I wonder what it is that Jesus is calling us to do today. I think it's more than to offer our thoughts and prayers. In times like this, times when I look down the list of 288, I think, shootings in our country in the past few months, I feel a little bit helpless. I wonder what can I possibly do to make a difference? I cry out to God, saying, how long, O Lord? And then when I go to his scripture, I don't hear him saying, just wait. What I hear God saying is, go, do, cause some trouble, cause an uproar. My friends, I think it is a tough time in our country. I know it is a tough time in our country. And this weekend, we remember and we give thanks to those who sacrificed their lives for our freedom. And I love our country. But I know we are not perfect. And I know that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I'm supposed to obey that commandment, but God above all else. I invite you to pray about how God may be calling you to make some trouble. For me, it's calling our senators, it's writing letters, finding an organization that I can stand behind, and donating to it. I'll close with one of the things that I think is most beautiful about this story from the book of Acts. And that is that in their moment of oppression and pain, in a time when it seems that Paul and Silas are really down, they're stuck in prison, they're beaten, they're shackled, instead of giving up, they sang, they praised God. And it was so powerful that there was a violent earthquake. And I have to think that if we as followers of Jesus Christ would pray and sing praises and act 
that we could experience some of that same power from God. Let us follow in the example of Paul and Silas. Let us cause an uproar and get into some trouble. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you so much for your holy word and how it speaks to us. Lord, we acknowledge that it is a difficult time to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That oftentimes we find ourselves questioning what it is we're supposed to do. It is a time when some will question our patriotism and say that we don't love our country, but Lord, we do. It's a time when I believe all of us are called to examine ourselves and to follow your leading, to move beyond thoughts and prayers and move into action. Amen.